and welcome to Dining with Death. This episode is on our playlist, Dining with the Damned, where we discuss criminals who are sentenced to die, their crimes, their executions, and we eat their last meal. Viewer Nicole R. has requested an episode that I thought we were going to be doing today, but we are having a heck of a time getting our hands on one of the ingredients. So Nicole, if you're watching, we haven't forgotten about you, and we are going to get to that episode shortly. I'm Stacey Lee. Let's begin. This case involves the somewhat unusual case of a man we know little about before the crime occurred, and who is known as a man who completely transformed himself after the terrible murders he committed. I'm speaking of Jonathan Wayne Nobles, who was executed in Texas in 1998. We know he was raised in foster care and claims he was abused in the foster system. We also know he was a former electrician and telemarketer who quit school after the eighth grade. He also claimed he had been addicted to drugs since he was eight years old. On the night of September 13, 1986, at age 25, Jonathan Wayne Nobles was wandering Austin, high on speed and cocaine, and had also been using marijuana and drinking alcohol. He was on parole for a robbery charge at the time, and even at his young age of 25, had had many brushes with the law. A man named Ron Ross is awakened in the middle of the night by screams. He runs into the bedroom of his girlfriend, Mitzi Johnson Nally, age 21, and sees a man stabbing her and her roommate, Kelly Farquhar, age 24, in a frenzy. Ross fought with the attacker and was himself stabbed 19 times, once in the eye, and that resulted in him losing that eye permanently. The man stabbing the women in the bedroom that also stabbed Ross was Jonathan Wayne Nobles. He is also wounded in the fight and runs from the home, leaving a trail of blood away from the house. Both Mitzi Nally and Kelly Farquhar were beyond help and both died as a result of the attack. Nobles went home after the murders and called his friend Marley O'Brien and asked her to come to his house and help him. She found Nobles in the bathroom of his home with a very large cut on his arm, which he had wrapped in a towel that was now soaked in blood. She reported that the bathroom was also covered in blood. Nobles changed his clothes, cleaned the bathroom, and put everything with blood on it into a trash bag, which he placed in the trunk of O'Brien's car. O'Brien drove Nobles to a friend's home where he shaved his beard and had his arm taped up. O'Brien later picked Nobles up at that friend's house and let him borrow her car while she was at work. Nobles had lied to her and his other friends and said he had simply been in a fight. After the murders were reported in the news, Nobles' friends begin talking and they are contacted by the police. Based on their interviews, Nobles was arrested. Fingerprints and hair left at the crime scene matched Jonathan Wayne Nobles. The evidence was only part of what the prosecution had, as Nobles openly and easily confessed to the murders and the attack on Ross. He was put on trial for murder, and he was found guilty of the murders of Nally and Farquhar in 1987 and was sentenced to death. So this is a little different than some of the cases that we've covered. It's pretty cut and dried. He was on drugs, maybe not in his right mind, wandering around for whatever reason. In fact, I read reports that said he doesn't even know why he did this. He kills these people. He attacks this man, and when he's caught, he confesses. We hear of cases like this a lot, so it's not really unusual, sadly, in that way. But what is unusual is what happens after he goes to prison. When Jonathan Wayne Nobles first goes to prison, he quickly alienates the guards and other prisoners. He is violent, he goes into rages, and he causes all kinds of problems. But in prison, he begins to read, and he begins to change. He becomes interested in Catholicism and begins attending Mass. Now, as we all know, people who find God and religion in prison, that is not a new story. That happens all the time. But this guy took it to another level. Nobles totally dedicates himself to religion and even becomes a lay member of the order and minister to his fellow inmates. He even began officiating at Mass and officiates at the Mass that was celebrated the night before fellow death row inmate Cliff Bogus was executed. He becomes very well liked and respected by the guards, 
the clergy and other inmates. Now, here's where I'm a little confused. I thought that people on death row were in their cell like 23 hours a day. So maybe this was a special situation where they liked him so much they let him do this. If you know why he was allowed to do these things, comment please and let me know. Because it sounds very unusual to me, knowing what I know of death row, for him to be able to interact this way with other prisoners. Nobles even begins corresponding with country musician Steve Earle, and they write to each other for 10 years. They finally meet face to face three days before Nobles is executed, and they spend eight hours a day for those three days together. Nobles even requests that Steve Earle attend his execution, which he does. Steve Earle writes a very interesting account of this time with Nobles. I will include a link to that account in the description of this video for those that are interested in reading the entire thing. Earls gives an account of Noble's last day on earth. He writes in part, it's 10 o'clock in the morning, there isn't much time left. At 12.30 we will be asked to leave the unit and John will be transported to the walls. In the death chamber we will be able to hear John over a speaker in the witness room but this now is our last opportunity to speak with him. There's quite a bit more to this account, like I say, if you would like to read it. The two men tell each other they love each other, and they part ways for the last time. They will not see each other again until the curtains are lifted in the death chamber. When I talk about his transformation being one that was really quite astounding, even one of the victim's mothers forgave him. So... Either he was one of the greatest con men alive or he really had changed. This mother even ends up attending his execution. And I'm really on the fence about this kind of stuff. Um, I go back and forth, but I'm pretty sure that if someone killed my kid, I, I don't think it's happening for me. Not saying it's a bad thing. I just don't see that happening in my life. You know what else I'm sure people don't see happening in their lives? their kids being murdered. So, never say never. Noble said not long before his execution, quote, I don't think I'm the monster who perpetrated these terrible acts. Nothing I can do for a thousand years can relieve me of my responsibility. Well, he got that right. On October 7th, 1998, Jonathan Wayne Nobles is taken to the execution chamber. He gives quite a long last statement where he quotes 1 Corinthians and then expresses love to the survivors of his victims, including Ron Ross, who is there in the witness chamber. He says to him, Ron, I took so much from you. There is nothing I can do to give it back to you. I love you deeply. Ron Ross later stated, I carried a lot of anger into that room, but after the conversation we had, I think I released it. I don't think you can ask for more than that in a situation like this. A lot of people say there's no such thing as closure, but it sounds like maybe he got some. Nobles is then laid back and the lethal combination of drugs is released into his body. He begins to sing the Christmas song, Silent Night. Mid phrase, he stops and takes a large gasp. He is pronounced dead a few minutes later. So what did the condemned Jonathan Wayne Nobles request for his last meal. I'm going to show you. For his last meal, Jonathan Wayne Nobles requested this. The Eucharist. It's a sip of wine and a wafer. I did a lot of research on the Eucharist because I am not Catholic and I do not ever want to offend anyone or to be disrespectful to anyone's beliefs. Because I am not Catholic, I cannot take communion. You can only take communion or eat the Eucharist if you have taken First Communion, and I have not. This is not technically the Eucharist because it has not been blessed by a priest. This is simply a little sip of wine and a wheat wafer. This is what the condemned asked for for his last meal, and this is what he had. The wafer is just a tiny 
paper thin disc of wheat flour and this is just a little bit of red wine. In my research I learned that you can use any kind of wine for the Eucharist for communion as long as it is made up of grapes. It technically can be raisins and it has to be something that is accepted as wine by the community. It can't be something somebody brews up in their basement. <laughs> so as we do here, I'm gonna give this a taste. This is the little wafer. It really has no flavor. It tastes a little like paper. <laughs> yeah, I've tasted paper. You were a little kid, yeah. That's what it tastes like to me. Yeah, there's really no flavor at all. It didn't dissolve quite as quickly as I thought it would. It did have a little bit of chew to it. And then here is the sip of wine. That's it. That is the sacrament for the Catholic Church, and that was his last meal. I hope he did change, and I hope he did some good in the last part of his life, because he had a lot to make up for. Thank you for joining me today on Dining with Death, Dining with the Damned. Like and subscribe if you'd like to see more. Stay safe, be kind to each other, and I'll see you next time on Dining with Death. Bye.